Hello students. So we are going to be looking at formulas and solving problems here for chapter 6. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, these problems are going to be dealing with uh, objects in circular motion, uh, things that are traveling along an arc, um, traveling kind of in a circle, and I think eventually we're going to get to some gravitational uh, problems here. So let's go ahead and get started here with these objects that are spinning. Uh, this says an audio CD has a diameter of 120 millimeters and spins at up to 540 RPM, that's revolutions per minute. When a CD is spinning at its maximum rate, how much time is required for one revolution? Then, if a speck of dust rides along on the outside edge, how fast is it moving? And what is the acceleration? All right. Um, I think I accidentally left the prepare statement there for you from, uh, from the example. It says, before we get started, we need to do some conversions. The diameter is 120 millimeters, which is 0.12 meters. Um, OK, thanks for doing the, the math there for us. The radius. Uh, therefore, is 0 0.06 meters. Uh, I'm going to write that down here. So the radius equals 0 0.06 meters. And what we're looking at is we're looking at a something that's circle and it's spinning here. It's a it's a disc. It's a, actually compact. It's a compact disc. Uh, the frequency is given in RPM. We need to convert this into uh, inverse seconds or into hertz. Okay, yep, I agree with that. So remember, at any given time, uh, the velocity is tangent. Uh, I'm going to have to go off here. And then the acceleration is uh, the centripetal acceleration is uh, pointing there towards the center. Let's see if our other pen is going to be any more friendly. Uh, I think it might. So centripetal acceleration. Uh, let's see, what are they asking us to find? How much time is required for one revolution? So how long does it take to go one time all the way around? Uh, if you remember from the lectures earlier, that is T, the time period. Okay. Um, I'll put there time period for one revolution. Um, how fast is it moving? So what's its velocity? Uh, technically, what's the magnitude of velocity? We know the direction. It's always tangent to the circle. And what is its acceleration? That would be its uh, centripetal acceleration. OK. Um, let's see if we can. Oh, we also have a little, one more piece of information that its frequency is 540 RPMs. So kind of keep that stuff there. We've got frequency equals 540 uh, RPMs which you can write that as 540 revolutions per minute. Uh, what they said is we need to convert that into seconds, um, uh, seconds in the denominator. So that's not a problem. We just do a little uh, conversion set up here. I want to get rid of minutes. I want that to go to seconds. So one minute is 60 seconds. You do 540 divided by 60. That's actually pretty nice because the zeros would cancel. You have 54 divided by 6, so that's 9. Um, if you want to think about it, it's revolutions per second. Um, uh, revolutions is just sort of like a, a description. So it takes that to go all the way around. You know, it does nine of those every one second. Um, so you, we could also write that as nine, uh, and this is a one over seconds, or um, nine inverse seconds. Um, if we wanted to be really technical, or we could say it's 9 hertz, but whatever. Uh, the formula that I gave you in class, which I'll write here again in a minute, uh, relating the velocity of an object spinning and the frequency, requires that, it, uh, that the, fre uh, the frequency be in uh, inverse seconds, or be in hertz. Okay. Uh, what was that formula? Uh, we came up with that. It was velocity equals 2 pi. FR, 2 pi RF, I'll write it as, sorry, as 2 pi RF, where remember F has to be in hertz. It's something to keep in mind for 
<clears throat> Homeworks and quizzes. So um, velocity is 2 times pi times the radius, which is 0 0.06 meters, times the frequency. So that's 9 seconds. Oh, hold on. 9 inverse seconds. So 1 over seconds. OK, that's pretty cool. If you plug that in the calculator, 2 times pi times 0 0.06 times 9, um, then you get 2 times pi times 9 times 0 0.06. Yeah, 3.4. And if you look at the units, we've got meters from that and seconds in the denominator. So 3.4 meters per second. Um, on your homework, I'm going to expect you to write a sentence here. I'm just boxing it here for the sake of time. Um, a speck of dust would be traveling at 3.4 meters per second. Um, but that, now I'm thinking, wait a second, I found the velocity. The first thing they asked me for the time. Okay, um, I'm going to, I guess, just go back a step in uh, the time period. I also ha gave you a formula. We discussed that, by definition, the time period is 1 over the frequency. So, um, and the frequency, so I was 9 hertz, so the time period must be 1 over 9. Um, this is inverse seconds, and so <laughs> if you think of 1 over an inverse, it's going to be, uh, the units will be back to the numerator. Uh, 1 ninth is 0.11. So t equals 0.11 seconds. I'll box that, but we'll do a little bit of assessment here to see if that makes sense. We said the frequency was 9 hertz. So what does hertz mean? Hertz means 9, goes around 9 times every second. Okay, so if it's going around 9 times every second, then um, it probably takes point, uh, one, 1 seconds, so a, a part of a second, to go around 1 time. Okay, that makes sense. And finally, velocity. So uh, or sorry, not, not velocity, acceleration. And we have a formula for that. The acceleration of an object traveling uh, in a circle is v squared over r. So you can take that v squared, 3.4 meters per second, square it, divide it by the radius, 0 0.06 meters, and we're making a mess of the board here. Um, but the final answer is like 192, I think I just rounded to 190 meters per second squared. All right, and so that would be the acceleration. Uh, it's a lot higher than, than G. You know, G is only 9.8. This is 100 and 190. So uh, yeah, that's like feeling a lot, very high um, acceleration. OK? That one looks pretty good. Let's make sure everything's still good with the recording device. Oh yeah, we're doing great. Let's move on to the next problem. Uh, this one's a conceptual problem. <clears throat> Just uh, wanted to kind of set this up to show you um, what it looks like if you've got this uh, circle vertically. Because in our next problem is going to be a, um, looking at something that's going horizontally. I wanted to make sure that we had uh, both situations taken into account. Um, it's also something that you can relate to. Uh, this says, engineers design curves on roads uh, to be segments of circles. And then they also design dips and peaks in roads to be segments of a circle with a radius uh, that depends on expected speeds as well as other factors, uh, like what's, what's there. A car is moving at a constant speed. OK, that's always that's sort of like a main idea we always want to remember. Constant speed <clears throat> goes into a dip in the road. At the very bottom of the dip, is the normal force of, of the road on the car greater than, less than, or equal to the car's weight? OK. So basically, we're going to need to draw a free body diagram on the car. Um, and we're only interested sort of in the up and down here. Now, what's making the car go forward? Well, it's the, uh, the force from the tires is you know, pushing it forward or whatever. But we're not even going to really worry about that. We're just really mostly worried about is the weight force and the normal force. So when we draw that, we'll draw the weight force going down. And then as we draw the normal force, um, we're going to kind of uh, think about this. So this is fundamentally the question. Do we want to draw it shorter than the weight, 
uh, longer than the weight or exactly the same, um, but just in opposite direction as the weight force. Okay, now just wait a second. Because if we think about this, since the object is traveling in a circle, we know as physics students that anytime an object is traveling in a circle, even if it's not speeding up, there is a velocity change, the direction is changing, so therefore there is acceleration, and that uh, acceleration is pointing towards the center of the circle. And the direction of the acceleration is also the direction of the net force. So there must be a net force pushing up. <clears throat> if I only have two forces here, <coughs> excuse me, and I know that the net force is up, that means that this normal force has to be uh, stronger than the weight force. So it's got to be greater in magnitude than the weight force. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, that's what your diagram is going to look there. And in fact, it is the normal force, which is pushing the car, if you want to think about it, all along the way, keeping it in that uh, circular path. Okay? And that's uh, and it's always going to be pointing towards the center. So uh, there you have it. There's the uh, situation. And that's why if you are <clears throat> in the car and you're at the very bottom of this uh, <clears throat> curve, or if you're maybe in, you know, uh, an extreme example would be like in a roller coaster or something, um, if you remember, uh, the normal force is also your apparent weight. It's kind of how heavy you feel, right? And so uh, I think we mentioned this earlier, so if the normal force is pushing up on you more than you normally would be when you, if you're just sort of sitting in the car when it was just like sitting still or going just along a straight uh, flat horizontal, you're feeling the car push up on you more than you otherwise normally do, and you would feel heavier. You would feel as if something was pushing you down into the seat, when in reality that's not what's happening. It's really the seat is pushing up into you. Um, when astronauts take off on a, on a rocket, um, the rocket is pushing to get there. They're actually kind of on their backs and stuff like that, but they're, they're looking kind of up towards the sky. The rocket is pushing them up, but it feels to them like someone is standing on their chest, pushing down on them. It's actually kind of a really neat uh, phenomenon. So, all right. Um, that was a, a, a circular motion, something in a, a vertical circle. This example is uh, dealing with forces of something traveling in a circle horizontally. <clears throat> so we're looking at a car that's turning a corner at a constant speed. So we can see it's kind of traveling like this. Following the segment of a circle, what force provides the necessary centripetal acceleration? We've kind of hinted at this a little bit before, but I want to make it really clear. I thought the book did a great job on this. So um, you can see the car is making the turns. Velocity is always tangent. Um, so it's moving along circular arc, constant speed, uniform circular motion. Um, and so that means that the acceleration must be pointed towards the center okay, of the circle. Uh, which forces are acting on it that are doing that? Well, not the normal, because the normal's uh, pushing up out of the pavement, if you think. Uh, the short answer is it's a static friction force, okay? That's the only force that's pointing towards the center. Here's a little bit more of an explanation, all right? Or uh, maybe a different way of coming at that same answer. <coughs> Excuse me. Imagine that the road was all icy, all right? Might be kind of hard at this time of year to think about icy roads or whatever, but that's okay. Just, you know, play along. So you got a real icy road, um, and all of a sudden you needed to make a turn, a sh sheet of ice, and you turn the wheels, and you're still going to go keep going straight. You're not going to be able to make the turn, okay? Um, because the car would slide straight ahead. So you've got to have the friction, all right? So uh, this says Newton's first law of the experience of anyone who's driven on ice. <laughs> uh, so it's got to be friction that's causing you to turn, okay? So it's, the question is which friction, okay? Um, and if you look at it, it's got to be the static friction, okay, and not the kinetic friction because kinetic friction is when it's sliding. Um, uh, kinetic friction would be if the, if the wheels were sliding, then that actually would be a skidding situation. And um, uh, you're not skidding, you're, you're turning, okay? So 
you've got to have that static friction force as you're uh, as you're as you're making that turn, okay, in order for that to happen. So it's it's basically the the tire on the pavement, um, the tire pushing on the pavement, the pavement pushing back. The uh, the pavement's not going to give. The earth's not going to all of a sudden start spinning more, but the uh, the car has the, the wheels which will spin, you know, forwards, and the car is attached to to those, and so the car ends up moving forwards. So lots of interesting things at play. Um, we wanted to talk about uh, that now, but throw some numbers on it. So I think that on your handout that I gave you, that page was was just sort of an empty page, but had all that that stuff written in on it. Wanted to talk about it. Uh, this is where we're going here, and um, every time I've taught physics, I've always made it a point um, to go through this particular example because I think it helps you appreciate uh, and understand what's going on with your car when you're making a turn. Because <clears throat> all of you, hopefully, are going to be driving or are driving and will continue to drive for the rest of your life. And um, maybe, just maybe, some of this stuff will come into your mind or it'll be a little bit more real to you um, in, in terms of understanding why road conditions are uh, so important to your safety and the car doing what you want it to do. So uh, the question is this, what is the maximum speed with which a 1500 kilogram car can make a turn around a curve of radius 20 meters on a level unbanked road without sliding. Now they say this radius is about what you would expect on a major intersection in a city, okay? So uh, we've got a car and it's making a turn and um, we want to figure out what is um, the fastest <laughs> that you can make that turn without skidding, without starting to, you know, slide this way out of control, okay? Um, uh, we saw on the previous slide that it's based on the static friction force, okay? So part of the idea is that we want to go as fast as we can um, and not uh, have our force our, our, uh, exceed that static friction maximum, as it were. So we want the, you know, we had a problem last chapter where it was like, the farmer's trying to pull the pig, but he's just not strong enough to pull the pig. Well, we want to turn <laughs> in such a way that the, the pig stays still, I guess. I mean, it doesn't go flying off here, but it's the car. We don't want the car to go to go skidding off there, and we want to see what that depends on. Okay. So um, we've got all that given information there, but I'm going to go to a blank slide, so we've got lots of room to write. It's actually not too terribly much work here. So um, if you look at the car, sort of like a, a rear view there, you've got the car, and it's sort of traveling. Uh, the idea is is that it's the static friction. So if this is so the top down view, you know the car's going like this from the side view, it's kind of going in and, and turning. So static friction is the only thing. If we're looking at a free body diagram, we've got the weight of the car going down, uh, normal going up, and static friction is what's um, having it point towards the center, you know, at, at every step along the way. I'll write some of that information down again since I think it's helpful. 1,500 kilograms. Uh, the radius is 20 meters. They're wanting us to find uh, the velocity max. And we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll talk about that here in a second. So I'm not... When I, when I always start to write this problem, I'm like, okay, where are we going with this? And we'll just do what we always do. We'll write uh, Newton's second law in the uh, x direction. So <laughs> that's easy. It's just static friction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. All right? So since that's the direction of the um, acceleration, the uh, acceleration in the x direction is your uh, centripetal acceleration. So that's your V squared over R. So static friction force is equal to the mass times V squared over R. <clears throat> so what we want to do is we want to find uh, the maximum velocity. So we don't know this. 
um, <clears throat> that um, is still less than or equal to this right here. We, we also don't know the static friction force. We, we know the mass and we know the radius, but we don't know the static friction force. Uh, kind of makes me think we need to go over here and write uh, Newton's second law in the y direction. So summation of forces in the y direction, that's normal going up minus weight going down. <clears throat> normal minus weight equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. It's not accelerating up or down, so that's zero, which means the normal force equals the weight. So the normal force equals mass times gravity. That's very familiar with us. Um, <clears throat> now I, I'm thinking that formula for the static friction force is mu s times normal. That's the fun formula. A moment ago we just found normal is mg, so fs equals mu s times mg. That's, that's definitely a piece of the puzzle, so I'll carry that up here. <clears throat> so we have mu s times mass times gravity equals m v squared all over r. All right, and once again, this happens every time. It seems the masses um, cancel out. It doesn't matter if you've got a heavy car, light car, whatever. Uh, the masses go away completely, so they're gone. I'm going to multiply both sides by r, so I get mu s g r equals v squared. Take the square root of both sides, so v equals the square root of uh, static friction force gr. In fact, it's almost um, <clears throat> that critical velocity that we always saw before. It was just um, gr, but now we have just a, a coefficient here, a multiplier, based on the static friction force. Um, we'll throw the numbers in here, then we'll do a quick assessment on it. So um, if you've got rubber tires on dry asphalt, um, the static friction force, a value of 1, that's, um, that's a good approximation right there. So, um, or a good value. So the velocity, the maximum velocity you're going to get, that's going to give you the maximum uh, uh, friction force. So it's sort of like V max is going to equal the maximum static friction force. 1 times 9.8 <clears throat> meters per second squared times a radius of 20 meters. So meters squared per second squared, square roots, and this ends up being meters per second. You run the numbers, it's going to be 14 meters per second. That's the fastest velocity that you're going to have. Autobots, roll on. No, Autobots don't dismiss you, I dismiss you. So keep watching, here we go. So <clears throat> the, um, that's going to give us that velocity. If we're any higher than that, then this acceleration is going to be greater than the friction force, and we're going to go sliding off. Okay, so um, this is the maximum velocity. <clears throat> what I want you to think about is what does that velocity depend on? Okay, it's um, that's this equation right here. Okay, looks to me like it depends on mu s. So that's the static friction force. That's your uh, rubber tires versus dry concrete. So that's your road conditions. Uh, that's G. That G is always the same. <laughs> you can't change that. All right. And then that, uh, as long as you're on Earth. And then R is how tight of a turn that you make. Okay. So the raise the term. So if you've got a very, if you're trying to do this really, if you're doing a really short turn, <clears throat> uh, small R, then you're gonna then you're gonna have to have a small V if you want to um, actually make the turn without skidding. <coughs> the slicker it is, uh, so if the roads are wet, or if your tires are bald, or if there's ice on the road, then mu goes down. And as, as mu goes down, as that coefficient goes down, then the maximum velocity that you can make the turn goes down. Okay, So this is where this comes to play. Every day you drive to school or you drive wherever, and you always go the same speed. You're used to it. It's just, it's just second nature. And you make that turn at that radius, okay, that you're always used to. And, and you make it. 
<laughs> every single time uh, without fail. It's all fine. But then one day it rains a little bit or it rains a lot or there's a little bit of ice on the road and it changes this. All of a sudden that velocity which you had been going um, and normally making that turn is too fast. And instead of making the turn, you slide into oncoming traffic, another car, a pole, um, hope, hopefully not an actual person or anything like that. Um, and it's not because you're a bad driver. Well, if you're not paying attention, then you're not, that's not being a good driver. Um, it's not because you took it too sharp. You took, it, you took, you took um, uh, uh, the same radius as always. And it's not because you're on a different planet. It's that because the road conditions have changed and you cannot make that turn um, at that velocity anymore. Um, the velocity is determined by, uh, in which you actually can make the turn based on the road conditions. So that's the other reason, 100% why it's super important um, that you're cautious and that you have these things kind of rolling around in your mind. I'm going to check on time. I think we're almost done. So, oh yeah, just enough time to wrap things up here. We have one more, uh, <clears throat> one more problem to show you. So, just a plug and play here. Uh, you're in your physics class, and well, okay, not right now. You are, um, and there's another student, 0.6 meters away. Estimate the magnitude of the gravitational force between you. Assume that you each have a mass of 65 kilograms. I know that might be insulting to some of you and generous for others, but, you know, that's okay. So, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to just give us a blank slide, please. Okay. Um, so, we're going to treat, there's you, there's the other person. Treat you all like, like objects here. No, don't take offense. So, mass one. 65 kilograms, mass two, 65 kilograms. This green's killing me here. Distance between the two of you, radius, 0.6 meters. Should be six feet, but it's 0.6 meters. That's okay. <clears throat> You're masked up. What's the gravitational force? Um, well, uh, let's ask Sir Isaac Newton, shall we? That's what he says. GM1 M2 over R squared, where G is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. 65, oh, kilograms. 65 kilograms all over 0.6 meters, and that needs to be squared. I encourage you to try keying that in uh, to Desmos or the calculator of your choice um, just to make sure that you can understand that process because I'd make sure you would do that if you were actually here. But anyway, um, you should end up with 7.8 times 10 to the negative 7th meters or in long form 0 .000000, I think that's enough zeros, 78. All right. So if you're watching this after Valentine's Day, then you can't use the joke. But if you are watching it before Valentine's Day, then you could say, hey, I feel like there's an attraction right now between us. Something like 7.8 times 10 to the negative 7th Newtons. Can you feel it? There is. And you're not just giving a cheesy pickup line. You're talking physics. And that's the real language of attraction. Thanks for sticking with me. I appreciate it. Drive safe.